Right, welcome everyone to another NJ2D video interview. Today I'm joined with Paul Thibado from the University of Arkansas. Um, it's an interesting one today because we don't cover much academic research, uh, but it's interesting research and developments coming out by Paul and his team here. Um, so Paul, if you just um, like to explain what you have been doing around using graphene in um, circuits and why your recent piece of uh, research is, uh, would, in your words, would say is exciting maybe? Sure, yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me to talk with you. Um, so yeah, we, uh, well, let me just start really quick with what's really special about graphene. Um, it's, it's, of course, just a, a single atomic plane of carbon atoms, but they're all connected together through the bonds of the carbon bonds, which are, which are very strong bonds. And as a, as a sheet, of carbon atoms, um, it has special properties that are different than, let's say, gas molecules, where they're all able to move freely independent of each other. And they're also very different from a solid where the atoms are trapped in a lattice site and they can just kind of jiggle around this small um, position within the lattice. So you can kind of imagine, I like to think of graphene uh, when, it, when it's freestanding or suspended, uh, kind of like the surface of the ocean, where it's just constantly in motion, and it can have large excursions in its motion. And uh, another a good analogy maybe would be like a sheet hanging on a clothesline, you know, in the wind, you can kind of see, because the sheet is all connected together by the fabric, but it can move in that third dimension on, on a large scale. So we'd been studying uh, this, the graphene using a microscope called the scanning tunneling microscope. And we noticed because it's at room temperature, just like the air molecules in the room, are, they're always moving because they're at room temperature. The graphene is also always moving. And it's moving by a large amount because it's free to move in this third dimension. And the idea came, well, maybe we could put the graphene near an electrode that was stationary and as the distance between the electrode and the graphene changed in time, uh, if we connected that to a circuit, it would cause current to flow in the circuit. So we were successful at doing that. And that was, uh, that's kind of the, the foundation of our paper. Okay, thank you. So in, in these um, circuits, um, you mentioned using the motion of the graphene. Um, is it the graphene sheet that's then allowing the work to be done across a circuit? Um, what's the difference with using graphene compared to uh, many other materials that are, are out there already in use? Yeah, the, yeah so the graphene is uh, basically because it's moving all the time, which is just its thermal energy. So it's at room temperature and, and that means it has some kinetic energy and, and that means it's moving. Um, and because it can move large distances, so it can move, uh, you know, tens or you know, 10 to 20 or 30 atomic site distances, unlike a, a solid. That large amount of motion is something that we can physically, you know, that gives us something to actually measure and makes a big difference. So, you know, it, it, that, that, that's the main difference really between graphene and other materials is just this fact that it's two dimensional. I mean, you, I guess you could use other materials that are two dimensional. I don't, I don't know if that would be a problem or not, but the strong bonds of graphene, you know, make it very robust. So it's uh, easy to work with and lasts uh, all, the, uh, you know, throughout our, you know, studies. So would you say it's the thermal motion of the graphene that is enabling the current to flow around the circuit then? Yeah, so basically we, we, we put a bias voltage between this stationary electrode and the graphene, and then it forms a little capacitor actually. And, the ch if you, and, the, and we have a, since we have a voltage there, the capacitor uh, means that there's a charge on the, um, on the graphene, uh, you know, divided by the voltage that we put on it. So the, if we put more voltage, we'll get more charge. But the other thing is true is with a capacitor, if you change the distance, let's say we make the distance between the, the tip and the graphene bigger, the capacitance will go down. And since the voltage is fixed, charge will leave the capacitor. So it has to flow off the capacitor. 
and it has to complete the circuit. So it'll flow off the capacitor, let's say on this side of the circuit, go all the way around to the other side and complete the circuit so that the charge is always equal and opposite on the capacitor. So we, when we go out like this, charge flows off the capacitor through the circuit and it does work on the circuit. And when the graphene moves back uh, toward the tip, it uh, charge has to flow back onto the capacitor, also causing it to flow through the circuit again and does work again. So by, by it physically moving, it's physically changing the value of the capacitance and then charge has to flow each time it does that. And the interesting thing is the graphene will move. There's an electric force between the graphene and the tip. And even though there's an electric force there, the graphene will continue to move. So the thermal force is bigger than this um, electric force. If we put too much voltage, it'll clamp down and just short out. It won't be a capacitor anymore. But we can put a fairly large voltage, up to 50 volts, and it still will continue to move and not clamp down. And so, so there's a lot of um, thermal force uh, involved, it turns out, in these sheets of graphene. Does that mean if you're just using then the natural movement, the natural thermal motion of, of um, graphene to create a charge on the circuit, there is the potential for a limitless kind of power without an external, external power source? You know, that's a good question. And that's kind of our next step is to see if that energy can be harvested. Right now, uh, there was a big question that, uh, you know, this is an AC current. It's a small AC current. And if you want to make, uh, if you want to make that useful and you want to harvest that current, you really have to convert it to a direct current instead of an alternating current. So to do that, you have to use diodes. And so our first study was to connect the uh, graphene circuit with the battery and the graphene and the electrode to two diodes, two diodes really, where one, one diode would force the current to go through, through it in one trajectory and then the other diode would have the current flowing through the circuit in a different trajectory. So there's two paths for the charge to flow and as a result we've separated it and turned it into what you call a pulsing DC current rather than an AC current. And sorry, got a chime coming in here. Uh, so uh, there's a paper from the 50s that says that if you connect a, uh, a diode to, a, to a, a resistor, which, was, which has Brownian noise in it, like kind of like the graphene, that it would suppress the, uh, the current flowing through the diode uh, to zero, basically, would zero out that, that current that noisy current. Uh, so anyhow, we, you know, we used a more complete theory. That paper was more of an argument, kind of invoking the second law and a temperature difference and whatnot. Um, we did a more rigorous approach using this emerging field in physics, which is, which is um, not highly developed yet, but called stochastic thermodynamics. And uh, that allows us to study precisely uh, what's going on with the energy, the heat, and the work done in that circuit with the two diodes. And what we found was a major power enhancement actually happens when you connect diodes to this Brownian motion, not a suppression like they found <laughs> in the 50s. And so it's interesting if you look at the Brownian ratchet Wikipedia page, uh, that page now has errors in it as a result of this study. Okay, thank you. And if, um, so say you can harness this, um, the energy from graphene um, to make, you know, essentially... A battery. Yeah, like a, a battery and make and continuous power through the circuits. Um, what, kind, what, what level of um, devices could this power? Are we talking like small, like nano-electronic devices or is it possible to create bigger um, circuits that could yeah, that... power, you know, larger electronics? Yeah, so we are actively pursuing that. We've been working on this project for three years now, and we've filed a few patents on the idea. Okay. And we're actually developing circuits now, which uh, duplicate what we did in the lab, but in a in a in a shrunken down you know format. And 
uh, and you can do some, you know, basically there's this, in our experiment, there's a small amount of power. It's actually nanowatts of power, but it's in a really tiny area where there's just this graphene in the tips and the graphene is not that large microns in size that's uh, having this thermal energy. So if you, if you do a, what, if you do a slight calculation, which you call as a, like a um, power density, what's the power density? So it's the power per unit area or the power per unit volume. You find out that the power density is comparable to solar power. So with solar power, you know, you can get, uh, you know, let's say a milliwatt in a, in a, in a centimeter by centimeter area. Uh, and that's the same as a nanowatt, you know, in a micron by micron area. So if we, so the plan is to scale this, uh, kind of like maybe really it's using the same technology uh, that um, computer chips are made. So it's a, it's a foundry service uh, that we're using and it's Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. We can submit um, um, fabrication designs to them and they build that and we replicate this circuit millions of these circuits are replicated across a tiny area and the hope is that it will produce um, you know kind of like that basically that kind of power density and so you'd have a uh, reasonable power in a chip but it wouldn't rely on the sun shining on it and you could stack these in the third dimension as well. So you can have a power density per unit volume. Um, and you could in principle build a really big one. Let's say like it's a meter by a meter by a meter of this massive dense electrical circuit. And then you could connect up power lines to it and transmit that power out to everyone's home or whatever uh, and distribute it. And maybe you have to have security around to protect it because it costs a billion dollars or whatever. So we don't really envision that as the future. We envision, envision delivering the power right where you're using it. Not having distributed power is what we say, not like transmitting the power to everybody. So any, any device that you have, uh, you know, would have this uh, any, anything that uses power would have this device right there where the power was used in generating, uh, storing this power in a capacitor, and then you'd kind of use that power later, like a rechargeable battery, basically, you know, and you'd use that power when you needed it. And it could, so it's a small power source, which is good. Those are hard to come by. Those are, people look for small power sources because then you can make small batteries and you could have these in sensors and you could distribute these. You could throw them out of an airplane or whatever and distribute them all over the place, measuring the temperature and relaying that information, let's say through a wireless technology. And you could never go find all those things and replace the batteries every six months. You know, so you, so you, it, it would enable technologies, you know, if you could have such a thing. Like solar, but just, it doesn't require the sun to shine on it. Sounds like there's, yeah, probably says a lot of potential for possibly environmental monitoring or even um, small scale medical monitoring as well. With that. Yeah, you know, we do, we were mentioning in one press release we did that, you know, people, uh, you know, pacemakers and stuff have batteries that need to be replaced at some point in time. And also, um, you know, like if you had knee replacement surgery, there's some mechanical element inside your knee and it will wear over time. If you had a sensor monitoring that and maybe telling your laptop every day, you know, how your wear your thickness is, for example, that would be better than, you know, just maybe having a problem someday and then having an MRI done to see what's going on, you know, inside you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it sounds like there is um, a lot of potential for these, uh, for, you know, self-generating circuits. So, but how long, um, obviously, you say you're working on it right now and building chips um at the moment how how long um will, will it be before we see um the, these chips and these circuits in in commercial real world devices yeah it's a good question um we are uh like you said make we're designing these uh circuits and building these circuits and testing them right now and the turnaround time is typically a, a few months 
it, it takes like maybe a month to come up with the design and then we submit them and then we get the chips back about two months later. And then we study those and do another design. So it kind of depends how quickly we can get through enough design cycles to get something you know done. But uh, you know it 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 looks promising. So I'll, um, maybe a year from now, it's it's I don't know about like having a product at Walmart, but having something that you know maybe you know some specialty. It'll probably be expensive. It's kind of like making a computer chip, you know. So uh, you know, initially the costs will be high. So if you want to pay a hundred dollars for your battery, for example, but at least it'll last forever. That's going to be a specialty application, you know, that someone maybe with the military or whatever is willing to, to do something like that. So I don't know if it'll be, if any customer at Walmart would want to buy it that, you know, I'd rather just buy a double A battery or something, you know, so there's, there's competition and there's got to be some value in it. Yeah, like anyway, there's, there's um, the the higher end, the higher value will is, is will be will be found by by some industrial sectors. So it, yeah. it's good to see that it doesn't seem to be that far off either. Um, so see if, if we if we because obviously you mentioned there quite a bit about what you've been doing. If we wrap everything um, in the interview up and that um, obviously you mentioned a bit about the future. So I'm gonna say if you could wrap it, what what's kind of like next for you and, and where does it all go from here now? Yeah, um, you know, I, I uh, you know, we had we put an animation in our press release. I think you saw that. That that animation is really from from a theoretical perspective is interesting in the sense that it's charging a capacitor and the energy of that system is changing, you know, in time, and that provide that's a it provides unique challenges theoretically. Um, in this area of stochastic thermodynamics. So we're, that's our next step for us theoretically is to better understand that. And the better that we have an understanding of the theoretical model, it all translates directly to what we do in practice. Um, so that's, that's that challenge. And then, um, and then again, the chip designs, there's a lot of, there are a lot of different types of circuits that are out there. There's a very interesting circuit uh, they can see on Wikipedia called the Cockroft Walton multiplier circuit. It's a really, uh, it, it, it's a passive circuit, but if you have um, charge, basically it, it, it takes any kind of current, even a noisy current, and it um, charges these capacitors, a bank of capacitors in parallel but then when you discharge these capacitors for some application, they're all in series. So what it does is it ends up amplifying the voltage to some high level of voltage. So that's something we're very interested in doing is, as well, figuring out the subtleties uh, and efficiencies you know, of these circuit designs. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you for the um, interesting insights. And it'll be good to see, hope, hopefully in a year, year or two, um, what happens um, to say, and, and whether we actually uh, whether we see them and where we see them should I say um, so to everyone watching I'd like to um, thank Paul for joining me um, today I uh, hope you enjoyed as much as I have and until the next NGA video um, goodbye and thank you <laughs>